let me just declare my bias right up front. I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I think capitalism is the, collectively the greatest thing the humanity's ever created. It has completely changed the world, and I'm going to prove it to you. Business is this great value creator, and the merchants are the heroes. They're not the bad guys. We can elevate humanity better, faster. I've known hundreds of entrepreneurs, and you know, very few exceptions. They weren't primarily in it for the money. Only 50% of the population is cognitively hardwired to be an entrepreneur. And the other half of us were just not programmed that way. Imagine if you had a ten or $20,000 a month residual coming that just took care of you, earning a small amount off the efforts of many versus 100% of just me. You know, we've been talking a lot in this series about investment, so I want to have an investment conversation with you. There's nowhere else on the planet where you can get this assembly of information that will talk to you about how to create wealth, how to protect wealth, and how to grow your wealth. So I think a great investment for you would be in Money Revealed. If you believe in this project and what we're doing and you're finding value in this information, then you should own it. So please, make an investment in Money Revealed. There's multiple packages available. Just pick the one that's right for you and revisit this information over and over again. Now we have a great episode set up for you, so let's jump right into episode five of Money Revealed. great anticipation. He's a personal hero of mine. He's somebody I've admired for many, many, many years. And when I had the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with him about money and entrepreneurism in his life, it was a highlight for me. And now I get to share it with you. Enjoy my interview with Whole Foods co-founder and CEO, John Mackey. John, thanks so much for your time. I really look forward to this interview. Thanks for inviting me. You have a foundation, I think, from your college days, maybe before, in, in philosophy, studying it intently. What role did that play in your life as an entrepreneur? I mean, it played a huge role. People oftentimes ask the question, if you're studying philosophy, is like, what good is that for? Right. But philosophy really taught me how to think. Mm -hmm. Taught me how to think critically, rationally, to see what's a bad argument, what's a good argument, mm -hmm. to be able to defend my positions with logic and reason and facts and evidence and so few people actually do that mm -hmm. and those people are just uh, go through life just being ruled by their emotions and they're unable to actually ever sort of um, get clarity so philosophy helped me see more clearly and if you're going to be in business uh, f deceiving yourself or fooling yourself is a very, very bad thing to do. You have to be able to see things clearly or you're not going to make good decisions. So absolutely f foundational. And do you still use it to this day as far as you know, your thinking and your process for you know, how to make decisions? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I still study philosophy. Yeah. It's not like uh, I figured everything out. So <laughs> I'm uh, still learning, still growing, and still enjoy studying philosophy. One of the things I do. What got you started in being an entrepreneur and going into business? I mean, I wasn't, uh, I didn't self-identify as an entrepreneur for a long time. I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't study any business classes when I went to the university, University of Texas and Trinity in San Antonio. I kept going back and forth between those two. And I basically just took electives. I studied philosophy and world literature, the humanities of all kinds, psychology, anthropology. I was trying to figure out the meaning of life and mm -hmm. meaning of my life in particular, what my own purpose was. And I, wasn't, I moved into this vegetarian co-op when I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. It was a 
housing co-op. I think they had about 18 people living there, two, two per room. And it was, I wasn't a vegetarian at that time, but I actually just thought I'd meet a lot of really interesting people in right. a vegetarian co-op. And I, but I was interested in all things counterculture. And so there were, yeah, this bunch of hippies living there going to, going to school. And I had a food awakening there mm -hmm. where I, I learned how to cook. I learned about natural food. I learned about organic foods. And the more I learned, the more passionate I got about it. Mm -hmm. So then I went to work at this small natural food store to earn some money. And I fell in love with retailing. And I thought to myself, you know, I could do this. I could, I could have my own store. And I went back to the co-op one night and pitched my girlfriend. And uh, what do you think about opening our own store and be a vegetarian store? And, uh, and, and she was very excited about it. I oftentimes think my life would have been perhaps very different if she had said, that is like really a stupid idea. I don't, want, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go into business. It's a dumb idea. I might have dropped it right there. But when you're young and idealistic and you don't have as much to lose, uh, we went out and hustled $45,000. We thought we needed 50, but we can only get 45, so we opened a little bit short. And it was in an old house. The first store was called Safer Way. Mm -hmm. And I was just passionate about selling healthy food to people. And people asked me what was the original purpose of Safer Way, and it was like, well, um, it was to sell healthy food to people, have fun, and earn a living. Right. And uh, we did all of those things. Renee and I actually moved out of the co-op and moved into the, was in an old house where the first store was. So we lived on the, first floor was a uh, store and the second floor was a, a cafe, a vegetarian cafe. And the third floor was an office and where Renee and I had a futon and we just slept there at night. So I literally lived in the first store. Yeah. Uh, so I just kind of followed my heart. I followed my passion and that led me on the journey. So I didn't, wasn't, you know, didn't like go to business school and say, there's a huge market opportunity in this whole natural organic. I've done a study on it and wow, we think it's going to be X amount of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars someday and we want to get in on the ground floor. It was like, I'm interested in healthy natural foods. I like doing it. So we did it. And that's the interesting thing. You had no business school training, no business background. What made you think that you could open a retail store, you know, deal with inventory suppliers, the whole thing? Or did you not know entirely what you were getting into? I mean, I think one of the advantages of being young mm -hmm. is not only do you have a lot of energy, uh, but you don't know what you can't do. Right. You don't yet know your limitations. And that enables the young to, we usually depend upon a lot of our breakthroughs with young people because they they naturally think outside the box because they haven't never been in the box and they naturally uh, just tend to be more creative and, and uh, you see many of the innovations that are happening in our society that shift things are done by people yeah in their twin in their 20s mm -hmm. I mean in my generation you know how old was Bill Gates when he started Microsoft or, or Steve Jobs when he started Apple or Michael Dell when he was in his college dorm selling computers I mean or and now you know how old was Mark Zuckerberg when he started Facebook. I mean, it's story after story after story of very young people that just went for it and were successful. In line with that, uh, you know, skipping forward a minute, you know, I serendipitously ran into you at a Whole Foods in Park City, Utah, and I saw you talking to the young people who were the workers in the store. Mm -hmm. So you still, you know, and I don't think I wouldn't have known this, that you still show up at the stores. You talk to the people and the staff who are working there. You're interacting with them. What is the, what's the motivation behind you doing that? I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's one of the highest leverage things that I do because, rightly or wrongly, because I'm the co-founder and all the other founders left over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the CEO for 40 years. Uh, within Whole Foods, I'm a legend. Mm -hmm. And uh, with so many stores today, a lot of the team members, you'll never get a chance to meet me. So when I can tour stores and connect with the people, it really, we know it really raises the morale. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I used to go into the stores and you know, try to, I'd put my operations hat on and mm -hmm. I'd see what was wrong with the store. But what I realized is I'm like the daddy, right? Mm -hmm. So they really want my approval. They don't want my criticism. Right. A lot of times they've gotten up at, you know, come to the store at three in the morning to make it look as absolutely perfect as they can because they know I'm coming. 
the last thing they want to hear is how they could be doing it better. Right. And so I try to really re restrict that type of negative feedback. And mostly I'm just trying to connect with people, thank them for their hard work, appreciate what they've done today, thank, you know, th thank them for being part of our team, mm -hmm. and uh, approve of them because that's what they want and that makes them happy and that helps the morale of the store go up and it helps our customers get better service. So it's, yeah. it's, I think it's actually one of the most impactful things I can do. I just regret now that, that I'm still just one man. I can't. I can't get to every store. Right. I, mean, I meet people all the time. I, how long have you been working for Whole Foods? I've been working for Whole Foods 15 years. It's the first time I've met you. Uh -huh. And I said, well, chances are you'll never meet me again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it count. <laughs> I could tell you they were beaming. Yeah, you could just see it. Like there, there is this sort of uh, electricity. They in the feel. Air. It makes them feel special. Yeah. Today, you know, he's paying attention to us. We must. We matter. Yeah. It's a self-esteem thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you were starting out in Saferway, mm -hmm. uh, and you then transitioned into Whole Foods, I think you, you, you yep, kind of merged two with years. that company after two years. Did you have at that point a vision for what Whole Foods would become? No. Uh, the whole vision thing, I mean, I think entrepreneurs have a, a bad habit mm -hmm. of recasting their success and almost it was destined or, or they look back and because of the human mind, the way it works, it looks for patterns, it looks for connections, it, it wants it to make all ordered sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I always make a joke that, uh, you know, I did not go up onto the top of the mountain and God did not speak to me and give me this assignment. Uh, uh, and I have been carrying out God's will ever since. <laughs> um, I mean, we did Whole Foods because Saferway was too small. We weren't a real grocery store, and we wanted to be a real grocery store initially. It was like, what if we could just have a bigger store that was like, I mean, you couldn't do one-stop shopping in Saferway. And Saferway was very pure. It was very idealistic. We, we, we didn't sell, it was vegetarian, and we didn't sell any, we didn't sell sugar, we didn't sell white flour, we didn't sell alcohol, we didn't even sell caffeine, mm -hmm. so no coffee. And also, it just didn't do that much business. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, we, we narrowed our focus so narrow. We were so pure, and so this is the way people should eat, that we unnecessarily restricted the market too narrowly. Mm -hmm. So when we did the first Whole Foods market, we said, well, we're gonna, still going to be natural, still going to be organic, still going to be focused around um, health, and, uh, but we are going to sell some products have sugar in them. We are going to sell beer and wine. We're going to sell coffee. We're going to sell meat. We, we're going to sell what people want to buy, but within the natural and organic framework. Right. That proved to be a very successful strategy because mm -hmm. while Safer Waste struggled, um, Whole Foods became the highest volume natural food store in the United States within a, just a few months of opening. Wow. It was a huge success. And that one was in Austin, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that an ongoing struggle even through the decades of trying to reconcile kind of this, uh, this moral or value framework with what's practical to go to the market with? Yeah, I, it, it really bothers non-business people mm -hmm. uh, who don't have to meet a market test. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that you're ultimately in business to serve customers. Mm -hmm. And so we're frequently judged like I'm a, I'm a vegan. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of vegans can accuse me of being a hypocrite because right. you sell meat and it's like I don't eat it but customers want to buy it I I don't eat a lot of things Whole Foods sells right. and you have to meet the market where you find it or you'll go out of business ultimately yeah. and so business people inherently understand that because they are all having to serve customers and I always tell my vegan friends like hey I'd like nothing better than to stop selling meat and why don't you? I said, because the customers keep buying it. <laughs> if they'd stop voting with their dollars for it, if they'd stop buying it, we'd stop selling it. Right. You're not doing a good job persuading people not to eat meat. Don't blame me because we're selling what the customers want to buy. I have never had that much problem. I've, I've always seen, I've been a, an idealist, but I'm also a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. And what's the art of the possible? What is it possible to do today? And, and then over time, art of the possible changes. You can do more in the future than you could do today. So you keep the long-term ideals in place while taking steps towards them, but you have, you have a long-term vision, you have a long-term view. So I've never really had this kind of anguish that other people have. It's just always seemed like you, you do sometimes make some trade-offs, but uh, they're necessary to, to meet, meet the market as you find it. 
Yeah, Ayn Rand used to talk about you know, uh, the problem if you have a contradiction between the moral and the practical. And, and you know, you didn't have an anything goes standpoint. There was still a framework from right. which you still had it. We still had yeah. our, our quality standards. That's right. And the, they kept us from drifting too far. In a lot of ways, Whole Foods has always had these two elements within it that, that struggle with each other, two polarities. Right. One polarity is, is what I call the, we, you can call the foodie polarity. Right. Somebody that's really preoccupied with food and all the different uh, aspects of it. And, they, and then within Whole Foods, there's a second element, which is the Puritan element. Mm -hmm. Food is not for pleasure, food is for health. Right. So food for pleasure versus food for health have struggled for the soul of Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And sometimes one waxes and the other one wanes and then the opposite occurs. So getting a good synthesis between those two has partly been what's led to our success. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had elements of both. If you're a foodie, you can shop at Whole Foods and find really outstandingly high quality, good tasty food. And if you're a Puritan, you're, if you're paleo or if you're vegan or if you're ketogenic or whatever your particular diet is, Whole Foods has got what you want. So if we were to extrapolate now to the general entrepreneurial and business world for people who are saying, you know, I've got a certain uh, set of values I want to put in the marketplace, but I also realize I have to meet the market in order to be able to be successful. Uh, what, what type of framework or considerations could you give them? It's, let's say it's outside the food, but it might be something else. Well, first thing I would do is in terms of conscious capitalism, I mean, it's like first you ask what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to drift away from your purpose. As you go out and fulfill your business, it's always a risk that you will forget what your purpose is, why you're doing the business in the first place, what you're trying to accomplish. So the purpose acts as, a, as your North Star that keeps you on track. Even if you wander off, you can get back on track by going back to making sure this is aligned with your purpose. Right. And I, secondly, I think the stakeholder philosophy is very important. Mm -hmm. The stakeholders being the uh, business doesn't exist only to create value for the, the investors and the owners. It also exists to create value for its customers, mm -hmm. for the people that work there, for the suppliers that trade with it, for the communities that we're doing business in. Uh, and then, in a sense, the larger, also the larger environment as well, minimize our, our environmental damage. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stakeholder philosophy, everything shifts. You begin to ask yourself, is this a win-win strategy for all of our stakeholders? Is this going to be good for our... If you're making decisions that are, say, mm, good for your customers but bad for your employees, right. maybe that's not the best decision. Mm. And if you're making one that screws the suppliers, maybe that's not the best decision. So how do you make decisions where they're all going to simultaneously flourish? Mm. And if you, if you keep purpose and stakeholders in mind, um, those type of contradictions and trade-offs uh, tend to get resolved pretty easily. So with people that have been doing that and maybe they've found success in some type of a career or an entrepreneurial venture, um, and over time they said, you know, I've worked hard, I've made some money. Um, what do you, you know, as far as that type of a person that, you know, obviously doesn't have a Whole Foods level of success, what do you think they should be thinking about as, as far as their own wealth protection or wealth development? Well, uh, first, of course, if you want to create great wealth, the, the best way to do it is to own businesses, mm -hmm. a business or businesses, and generally concentrated. Mm -hmm. And then that compounds, in a sense, over a long period of time, and that's how la large wealth is built. You, if you look at almost all the super wealthy people, they got it through building something mm -hmm. and some type of business and from real estate to to computers to software to i mean jeff bezos the richest mm -hmm. man in the world he built it through the took in the internet and uh, there's been so many different strategies and as the world technologically evolves there's always going to be new strategies like the next thing the next big thing will always be coming along i mean you take uber for example first time i did an uber and it was like why didn't i think of this <laughs> this seems so obvious right yeah. and i could have thought of it mm -hmm. and perhaps i would have if i'd been in a different generation and a younger person right one thing i always encourage people to do is as you go along uh, don't get too greedy in the sense you should be taking some off the table it's like a, a poker metaphor if you're if you're uh, it's always good to, you start out with a stake, eventually, if you're doing well, you pull out 
the stake and then then some and then you're just playing on your winnings in a right. way so if, if catastrophe occurs you're still a winner right and I have always done that with Whole Foods I have gradually and steadily sold stock mm -hmm. for really we went public in 1992 that was the first time I sold any mm -hmm. but I probably gradually sold it all the way up through the Amazon acquisition a year ago mm -hmm. and also I really believe in the philosophy of I think I initially picked this up when I read a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. Yeah. And the Richest Man in Babylon, one of the principles is pay yourself first. So basically take at least 10% out mm -hmm. of your paycheck and put it away and invest it and it, you don't touch it. It's, mm -hmm. it's just you're going to let you're going to let it compound and grow over a long period of time. And that's not that hard to do once you get in the habit of it because it doesn't really change your style of your, your lifestyle because you used to live on 10% less than you're making right. and you did fine and so there's a bad habit of people tending to as their salary ratchets up they just ratchet up their their lifestyle right. and I don't think you should ratchet up your lifestyle I think you should and, and we see this in cultures that are wealthy cultures that the Chinese, for example, are very good at saving. Mm -hmm. The Jewish uh, faith has been also put an emphasis on saving, mm -hmm. saving and investing. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a lifestyle habit to not, in, in America we tend to go for flashy cars or big screen televisions or the latest, uh, hottest new I, I, uh, iPhone or, or whatever. We're out there chasing the Teslas and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, I just always believe that you should be about creating lasting wealth, and mm -hmm. that's through being reasonably frugal and saving and investing. And that's the proven over and over and over and over again strategy to create and maintain wealth. And I mean, if you're 24 years old and, you, and you've created a Facebook, then this is not a, you don't have to worry about right. this. But that's, that's a very small percentage of the people that, that hit that type of jackpot in their lifetime. It's, you know, I mean, hundred people maybe I mean out of seven and a half billion or eight billion <laughs> I think it's better to whatever you're doing save the money mm -hmm. invest it yeah. and and then keep doing it your whole life and you will become a millionaire uh, and potentially very wealthy uh, by the time you reach uh, late middle age you know I uh, speaking of Whole Foods and investing I remember back uh, after Whole Foods went public and went opened up in uh, my, my town where, near where I grew up Ridgewood New Jersey uh-huh yeah and I remember they had a direct traffic in and out of that parking lot when it first opened it was just so busy and my mother called me up saying you got to buy Whole Foods stock and I, at the time I had an E-Trade account and I'm like I think it was like $25 a share or something like that. and I said it looks like all the growth is already priced into it. I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing it, which just shows like, you know, I'm not a stock picker. That's why it's not my, my You know, advice. I'm on the board of directors of The Motley Fool, uh -huh. and that has been really good for me because uh, I've made a ton of money through basically following their stock advice. Mm -hmm. And their basic stock advice is the best companies always look fully priced or yeah. overvalued. Yeah. But, I mean, Amazon's gone up 200x since it did its initial public offering. Microsoft's gone up even more because right. it's had a longer time to compound. And at any, in no time, I mean, maybe once or twice in their histories, after a big market washout, did it look, did they, the buy, you could say that's a really good value. Problem is, when you have that kind of market wipeout, everybody's too scared right. to invest because maybe we're going into a Great Depression. And so uh, it's just better to realize if you get a great company, you just buy it and hold it and let the compounding work. And, and here's the thing, you'll have, you'll have some duds. Mm -hmm. um, I actually own 136 stocks. I counted them up recently. Wow. And I mean, every year I sell off a dozen or so that mm -hmm. for tax, tax loss harvesting because they were duds. Right. They didn't work out. But the ones that do work out, they go 5X, 10X, 20X. Mm -hmm. And just one or two of those pays for all the other losers you'll ever have. And they just continue to compound, and you and they're compounding tax-free. You're not having to pay capital gains taxes on those right. stocks as they work their magic. Um, so I diversified. I realized, of course, in hindsight, that if I had kept all of my money in Whole Foods, I never sold any shares, I'd be far wealthier than I are and I am today. Because mm -hmm. Whole Foods just did so well since since we created it. Mm -hmm. uh, we went. We were a 30x gainer since our IPO to the sale in wow. 25 years. However, remember, I bought when we had the 
mo I got almost all my shares when it was when we company was forty five thousand dollars and I had ten thousand of the forty five thousand. Right. That's a a thousand X. Right. So I was just prudent in the sense that uh, I kept taking money off the table and it's done well on my other investments, but it would have been foolish for me to keep all the money in, in Whole Foods for all those years because what, what would be more horrible, you do something for 40 years, you, at one time you're worth you know hundreds of millions of dollars and then or maybe a billion dollars and then it all c it comes crashing down, uh, you'd probably blow your brains out. Yeah. You'd, you'd be so depressed. So I never did that. I was always more prudent, I suppose. And for people in the advice saying if, if you're saving 10% and you're saying invest it, uh, you find companies you like? Or? You know, I mean, I, honestly, I, I broke down my uh, investing philosophy recently because I did a talk at Freedom Fest on it. So 30% mm -hmm. of our assets are in public stocks. Mm -hmm. And about another 30% is in index mutual funds, mm -hmm. like uh, Vanguard Total Stock Market Index and, and, and Total... Uh, total world markets and things like that. So very diversified, but through low cost index funds. Mm -hmm. And then we have about another 30% that are in um, basically sh short term cash and bonds because if the stock market has a, ma a massive complete meltdown, you want to have, you don't want to have all your eggs in the stock market. Right. So it, at our, it, my wife's and my age, it's prudent for us to have a sizable chunk that's going to be you know, it may not grow, right. but it's, still, it's not going to lose very much, even if you have a market washout. And then about 10% you know, in real estate mm -hmm. uh, and some venture capital investing. That kind of is how it works out. Wow. So uh, was there a period of time as the CEO uh, that you were taking, if I remember, like a dollar a year salary or something like that? Oh, yeah. I've taken, I haven't really been compensated for 13 years now since, no, 2006, so 12 years. Mm -hmm. And what was the reason that you didn't want to take compensation, or did you take it in other ways? No, I didn't. I uh, my stock options were all were, were that I would have been entitled to were given to the our foundations, mm -hmm. and that served as sort of like an endowment for those foundations. Um, you know, it's very hard for other people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I had enough money. Mm -hmm. I was fabulously wealthy. Mm -hmm. I didn't need any more. I didn't. I wanted to take money off the table in terms of what my motivations were, or, or, and I wanted to embrace a servant leadership, which I talk about in Conscious Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I thought taking a huge compensation or huge stock option grants would dilute the purity of that uh, service attitude. And the only time I regretted it was back when the market wiped out and. 2008, Whole Foods market stock went down 90%. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, my wife was very upset. She said, you got to start taking a salary. I mean, you know, we got to pay the bills. <laughs> I said, do you know how much I'd be the laughing stock? I can go back and start taking a salary. Forget it. We'll get through this. Mm -hmm. We'll sell some other assets. Um, but uh, it was the right thing for me to do. It was what my heart called me to do. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I recommend it for other people? No. It was just right for me. Yeah, and, that, and that's interesting. I think that's, in the end, what people have to figure out is just, you know, what is right for them as compared to trying to perfectly model somebody else's life. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I've always been a guy that's, I'm very intuitive, I try to be in touch with my...